my journey, it all makes sense. Uh, you know, growing up, my family had a camp in the Kawartha Lakes, and my parents would set up a big tent uh, on a wooden platform where me and my brothers would sleep every night, and it was great. And of course, um, the birds would wake us up every morning at sunrise, and um, we would spend our days down by the river and mostly fishing from the dock. I really liked to fish uh, when I was a kid, and I imagine that's what you know kind of gave me the passion and inspired me to somehow uh, make a living from fishing. But on the same note, uh, every fall at that camp, um, we would wake early in the morning, but not to the sounds of birds, um, but to the thumps and thuds and booms of uh, shotguns uh, from the duck hunters that would be blasting away along the river. And instead of fishing from the dock, I found myself um, down at the docks waiting for those hunters to come back in their canoes uh, and duck boats to, uh, to see how many and, and what kind of, of ducks they had harvested. And, you know, those experiences were regular throughout my childhood and certainly made me want to be one of those guys, uh, you know, when I was older. So, you know, as soon as I was of age, I asked my dad if uh, I could start hunting. And of course we took the hunter safety course and the firearm safety course and immediately started um, going on sort of modest hunting trips, you know, usually on old bush roads or abandoned rail lines and uh, grouse, rabbits and squirrel were pretty much uh, all we were after. But in doing all this, I, you know, I quickly learned that if I was going to be a good hunter, uh, I'd better know how to shoot uh, efficiently and plinking with 22, you know, at um, pop cans or throwing clay targets with the old handheld thrower uh, were, were the only method we had. Um, but we enjoyed doing it and eventually invested in a mechanical launcher to throw the, the clay targets out and uh, set up a range, um, you know, back in the field um, for 150 yards where we could sight in our, our deer rifles. And over time, you got pretty proficient at it. And getting practice uh, is certainly the key to becoming a good shooter uh, and hunter. But most of my memories, of course, aren't about how well I shot or didn't shoot uh, during these excursions. They were of just being out there, you know, with friends and family and, and making bets on shooting a double or trying to knock the cap off of a bottle. Uh, little things like that um, make great memories. And today, all those experiences and practice come into play, you know, whether I'm shooting at a caribou at 250 yards in the Arctic tundra or trying to shoot a woodcock on a 10 foot flush in some uh, thick alders. It's all uh, experiences that uh, spawned from shooting uh, at a young age. Um, so, you know, use safely and properly. Firearms can be a great way to spend time with friends or family and uh, maybe even make a career that includes firearms. You know, be it law enforcement or the military or marketing and sales. Uh, the sky, the sky's the limit, really. Um, so shoot straight, and thanks for the opportunity to, to share my story, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, you know, I wish I could uh, be here live to answer some questions and stuff like that, but um, I'm out bear hunting. <laughs> uh, thanks again, and enjoy. So that was uh, Mike Miller, who managed to uh, turn his passion for fishing and hunting into a full-time uh, career. So uh, I have with us today, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, some more realistic options. I don't know how many jobs there are to be a uh, shooting or hunting celebrity in Canada, but we certainly have a large industry in Canada. The industry today across the country employs more than uh, 48,000 Canadians. That's through all sectors uh, of our industry. And joining us today, I have some of the uh, key employers and some pretty exciting individuals uh, to talk to you a little bit about how they got their start in the business and um, about the companies that they represent and the types of job opportunities that are available uh, at these companies. So with us today, I have Spiros Krisahu, who is the general manager for Stover Canada. Stoger is a large distributor that represents most of the high-end Italian brands in the Canadian market. 
We also have Terry McCullough, who is the general manager and senior vice president for Savage Arms Canada. Savage Arms is one of our leading manufacturers in Canada. And Savage Terry will talk to you a little bit about Savage employs over 150 skilled tradespeople uh, in their manufacturing uh, facility in Lakefield, Ontario. We also have Lee Collins with us. Lee Collins is a principal at Eastern Outdoor Sales. Eastern Outdoor Sales is a sales agency. So they employ full-time salespeople to travel across the country and represent uh, imported brands in Canada. And we have Adam Patterson from the Korth Group. And the Korth Group is a distributor and sales agency as well, representing uh, imported brands in Canada. So I'm gonna go through the panel and get each of our uh, individuals to talk a little bit about how they started their career. And then also, then we'll go through again and talk about uh, the types of jobs that are available at each of their companies. So Spiros, I thought I would uh, start with you. You've had quite a diverse career in, uh, in um, the industry in Canada. And I thought maybe you could tell uh, our attendees a little bit about how you got your start. Uh, sure. Thanks, Allison. Um, yeah, it's I've been, you know, fortunate and I uh, consider myself blessed, blessed every morning when I get up because uh, I'm in the industry and, and working and stuff I love. Uh, you know, started shooting and, and hunting at an early age. I didn't come from a family of hunters, uh, you know, a little bit in the military, uh, you know, overseas. But uh, we started getting involved and uh, it was just a passion. Uh, I ended up doing a lot of volunteer work with Safari Club International and some of the various groups uh, got a uh, employment are working with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, uh, both on the club side as a club coordinator, and then became the hunter education coordinator for the province. And, and that was an exciting time, really got me connected. Uh, we were able to build the, uh, and some of you would know, the uh, OFH Mario Cordellucci Hunting and Ferret Fishing Heritage Center in Peterborough. Uh, Mario was a friend and, uh, and a lot of the mounts were donated by another friend. And so we were able to get that established. Uh, doing some marketing, I swapped over and joined Stoger Canada at the time. Uh, it would have been the fall of 2008. Uh, I started with Stoger Canada as the law enforcement and defense manager. Uh, and then from there had moved into the general manager position. Uh, and so it's been like, uh, you know, six, seven years now. Uh, in that position, uh, Stoger Canada, you know, located in Oshawa. Uh, I don't if we want to get into the that part right now. It's we had, were sitting on seven acres in Oshawa, a couple buildings, uh, warehouse, and uh, offices, and it's our national distribution center for Canada. And and uh, you know, Allison, you mentioned some of the certainly the high end Italian brands, and we're actually uh, we're in. Uh, 19 countries with over 32 companies. Our most recent acquisition was the one of the highest end English brands with Holland and Holland. So it's, uh, but uh, yeah, so we're we're quite uh, diverse in our brands, and uh, we're the one thing you know we are not an investment company. We're we're certainly we we buy to 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 complement our, our assortment. I've been fortunate uh, within my positions that I've been able to travel the world. I've hunted in Russia, you know, throughout Finland, uh, got a trip coming up in Africa. And, and so there's some exciting times. And uh, I know that, you know, Dave, maybe something down the road we can talk about and uh, do something with that. We could talk about some of the exciting trips, uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, that's how I landed here. And uh, like I said, I'm blessed every morning to be able to wake up and be in, in this industry and working in a passion, uh, a passionate field uh, that uh, we're in. Thank you. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the number of employees and the jobs you have uh, at Stoker, but I wanted to move on to uh, Terry. Terry, uh, actually, um, we talked about Savage Arms being one of Canada's leading manufacturers. Terry, talk a little bit about how you got your start in the industry. Um, you know, for me, it was, it was a journey that took me through aerospace in Toronto. So I started my career as an entry-level engineer at McDonnell Douglas out in the uh, Toronto airport area. And after about 11 years, um, you know, we were acquired by Boeing. And uh, the company, um, you know, had a lot of capacity. And we were number three in the world for commercial. And uh, so the company went on a major downsizing. 
so I found myself, uh, you know, again, taking, taking advantage of my current engineering background and got into a lot of uh, Sun Microsystem type programming and, and some antiquated languages that are, are, are a bit passe now. But um, so it really led me to uh, uh, my industrial engineering degree and becoming a manufacturing sort of more expert uh, as opposed to being a firearms expert. Um, so, so then I joined a, a large French automotive um, world, you know, like $20 billion in sales worldwide with uh, 235 sites in uh, something like 30 plus countries. So it was a real huge monster of a large automotive supplier. So that afforded me a lot of really interesting um, learning opportunities to continue, continue to develop my engineering background and, and manufacturing background. It led to some senior appointments uh, of large plants in the US and in Canada. And then, uh, you know, obviously having that strong technical experience, I got recruited by Savage Arms in 2007 to take over their Canadian um, manufacturing group. So, um, you know, today we're we're, we're quite large. It's been a great experience for me, uh, uh, Spiro suggested. And, and uh, Michael said that, you know, it, 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 it's really, uh, you, you, you choose your path and you choose your career and you try to get as much experience that you think will help you. And then you really need to take advantage of those opportunities when they arise. And don't be afraid to go out on a limb a little bit. You know, I, all I ever had was a Boy Scout badge to shoot 22s and I'll, I'll finish with this when I first joined the company um, our former chairman Ron Coburn who was quite a charismatic guy in the the industry but but he basically I said Mr. Coburn thank you very much for you know trusting me with your your, your Canadian rifle manufacturer after all I'm not a firearms expert he says Terry Savage has plenty of firearms experts <laughs> We need manufacturing experts because that was really what he was trying to do at that time with the organization. So it's been a great 14 years. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. Well, and the upside is you get to live in cottage country. <laughs> yeah, I live right up here in Buckhorn and I'm a half an hour from work and it's just tremendous. You know, we, really we fought through the hours. COVID and yeah, you've been to the plant. So it's, uh, it's quite an experience. We have 180 employees now. And we're working to produce 1,500 rifles per day. And we're sold out to December of 2022. Yeah, that's fantastic. We'll so talk it's a really quite a... The, We'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, time. sure. Um, I want to move next to Adam Patterson from Western Canada, just to emphasize the fact that this is a uh, truly national industry. We have um, uh, companies located all across Canada. Certainly the retail sector is huge across Canada, uh, but also the uh, distribution uh, and sales um, sector is large across the country as well. Adam is with uh, is the marketing director for the Corth Group, which is located in uh, just outside of Calgary, Alberta. And Adam, uh, talk to us a little bit about your career because you've gone from Ontario to Western Canada and, and uh, had some pretty interesting job roles. Yeah, thanks, Allison. And, and as you mentioned, I was fortunate to escape Ontario um, <laughs> and found my way in, into Western Canada, which is a pretty great place to live. Uh, my journey started actually, I, I started shooting prior to um, you know, my early adolescence and, and that led to an interest in wanting to work in the firearms industry. And so while I was in college studying business, a component to my course was a, a co-op program where I, you know, you have to go and work at, at various businesses in, a, in any sort of capacity that the school sold you on. You know, these are going to be pretty high-end jobs that'll set you up for a great future. And, and in my case, it has. Uh, but working retail was a sufficient um, a role to achieve that co-op credit. Um, so I actually did my, one of my co-ops at Elwood Up Sporting Goods in early Ontario. Um, and that uh, sort of was a springboard eventually to move on to, to other jobs. But in the meantime, I went back to university and got my degree in business. Um, and from there, went to the distribution side. I worked at MD Charlton out of Mississauga, and I was the national sales rep for uh, Sig Sauer and Blazer and, and Mauser and, and a variety of brands. Um, and from there, I was recruited to work for Corth Group, uh, which led me to management roles uh, here at our head office in, in Okotoks. Oh, fantastic. Next, we have uh, Lee Collins. Lee is a principal at Eastern Outdoor Sales. Uh, Lee, talk to us a little bit about how you got your start. Oh, Lee is muted. 
There we go. Okay, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I uh, graduated from Sheridan College for business and I got into the, uh, I was working as a, in, a, in the restaurant business for a number of years as I was going through college. So I, I was actually a, a manager of a restaurant, a 100, 170 seat restaurant for a number of years and uh, always had a passion. Uh, the restaurant business wasn't really conducive to family life or to, you know, um, that, that sort of thing as you got older. It was great uh, as a young single guy being in that business, but uh, as I was getting, um, you know, older, I was looking for something that I was really passionate about. I was always passionate about sports and, and the outdoors. And so I actually got a job in Scarborough uh, working for a distributor, uh, was in the racket and uh, golf business. Uh, at the time, they carried some very prominent names of sporting goods. They did uh, Ping and Slazinger and Puma um, and Carlton Badminton Rackets and uh, just a, a plethora of, of strong brands that eventually, as they grew in Canada, they went out and opened up their own uh, um, in, uh, buildings and their own distribution and, and so on and so forth. But I, um, I have kind of springboarded into the camping industry and I, I joined uh, um, a gentleman that was um, uh, starting a, a sales office and uh, the company that we represented was the largest tent manufacturer in the world at the time. And um, I was with him for a number of years, uh, great experience um, opening a, a Canadian operation and, and working under his wing uh, for a number of years. And then that, um, that sort of uh, parlayed me into a role with Woods Canada. Um, and I was with them for about 10 years as a product manager and sales uh, manager. Um, and that took me into the United States and it took me all across Canada as far as, um, you know, shows and different events and participating in buy group shows in the U.S. and so on and so forth and uh, I did that for a number of years and then I got an opportunity to get into um, uh, the rep uh, side of the business uh, working for an agency. Uh, at the time we were um, you know mostly in eastern Canada uh, but in the time that I've been with the agency over the last uh, 16 or so years now coming into my 17th year um, we've expanded nationally across the country, um, and we carry some some terrific brands of products, including Savage. And uh, Terry and I uh, work together um, and some of his team, um, and um, we we are very very blessed to have some some great brands that we represent uh, in the sporting goods and shooting sporting goods uh, in particular, as well as camping and the outdoors. Thanks. Thank you so much. Actually, so Lee, let's stay with you and just uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about what, how many people you employ in Canada and what is, what briefly is, uh, do sales reps do? What is the job? Yeah, so we, we employ uh, 16 people. Um, five of those people are office staff. The other 11 are uh, full-time sales representatives for our agency. Um, and basically the business is really about relationships. It's as much about passion for the outdoors and, it, and uh, having um, you know, that, that drive uh, to get up each morning um, and, and sort of um, you know, make it your uh, goal to um, maintain, grow, uh, meet new opportunities um, in, in the outdoor uh, business in particular. I would say, and most of the people on this panel would probably agree with me uh, when we say that they're some of the greatest people you'll ever meet. Um, they're really down to earth for the most most part. Um, they are passionate about the outdoors and it's a fun business. So if you have that uh, inkling, that sparkle, that kind of, um, uh, that, that sort of sets you in that mode of, of enjoying sort of um, the sport and, and being a participant in the outdoors, um, and dealing with the people, type of people that are selling to the consumers that enjoy that type of activity, um, that's that's a, you know obviously a bonus of of being in the in the occupation of of what we do. But the salespeople that we have, uh, like I say, it's really based on relationships. It's um, um, it's it's all it's all based on proficiencies and making sure that you do what you say you're going to do. Um, it's a very small industry, and so. You know, I, I'm always a preacher of being honest and straightforward uh, with everybody that we deal with. If we don't, if we don't have the answer to a question, 
uh, we be honest about it and, and say that we don't know the answer and we get that answer for the, for the customer. Your sales, um, reps, your sales reps are out building relationships with retailers yes. that you're yes. looking to. Correct. Yeah. It's a traveling job. It's uh, it a lot of. It's almost a self-employment job. There, it's it, it's it pretty yeah. a lot of freedom. Yep. Yep. It is. It's uh, it, it. There's a lot of freedom and a lot of discipline that you have to have, obviously, when you're uh, when you're doing it. Um, uh, obviously, the focus is on building, maintaining, and building the business with. Uh, relationships that we have existing and also growing it uh, with new opportunities that come along. Excellent. And Spiros, your your model is similar, but you also are a warranty center. You're it's a little bit different. You you are um, more of an owner of the brands that you represent. Yeah, absolutely correct. Where we are um, Stoger Canada is I mean directly owned by Saco out of Finland and which of course is owned by Beretta. Uh, we are like fully owned by the group. We only uh, basically manage, import, distribute uh, brands that are owned by the group. Uh, some exceptions would be within the law enforcement when we're doing tenders or packages. But uh, really, we, we manage the, the products that are owned by the group, uh, import, distribute. We have 23 people at the office uh, and we, we hire four agencies and contract four agencies across Canada with approximately 12 salespeople and admin staff for those agencies as well. But they're independent agencies similar to Lee's scenario. Uh, we're, you know, the interesting thing we, you know, and, and to your point, we do um, the sales service support warranty all that happens at, at our facility the the interesting thing when looking at employment within the industry is and and terry will certainly be able to talk to that as well uh, especially is you know we get a lot of people wanting to come work for us because hey i love beretta i love benelli uh, you know i want to be in the gun industry and that's great uh, but we you have to sort of appreciate the positions you're applying for. When you're an accountant uh, working for us and you know, uh, you know, you're basically dealing with books and numbers, you're not out shooting on the range and hunting, right? Uh, we, you know, we have office cleaners that come in and clean. You know, even within our warehouse, you know, uh, they're, they're managing boxes, uh, they're basically receiving boxes, shipping boxes. You know, the, the fact that there's cool product within those boxes is, is separate. So understanding what positions you're applying for and that now it's great to be in a company, uh, you know, like, like a Beretta group or within the industry, with any of the hunting, shooting, sports industries, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's always pretty exciting to be part of that company. But knowing that your role within the company isn't always as glamorous. Certainly our sales uh, managers, you know, our marketing managers, uh, you know, are, are, are dealing with the product a lot more. They're, they're out in the field a lot more. They're, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're engaging in that, that aspect. So, so are, just as a, there are opportunities for business admin graduates, for accounting graduates, for sales and marketing graduates. Um, so combining uh, uh, an, a degree with the opportunity to work in an industry uh, that you're passionate about is, is sort of a best case scenario. If you have a business degree or an accounting degree, um, yeah, hey, if you're gonna do accounting, wouldn't you like to do it within the, within the shooting sports industry or put that business degree to work within the industry? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's, that's, that's the key part, right? There is, there's all sides of the business that we're involved in, you know, certainly as a sales in the, in the sales group and, and the, the, the agency sales groups, they're, they're out with the dealers and building those relationships and, and engage with the product a lot more. But yeah, there's, there's all kinds of uh, positions, um, even for us, you know, we're, we're still struggling. And I mean, if anybody out there, I know it's not a university program, certainly in Canada, while it is in Italy and, and, and England, uh, gunsmithing uh, at, at a higher level is, is, a, is an area that I would say the industry is desperate for. There's a lot of, you know, guys who liked, uh, you know, uh, guys, gals that liked playing around and handling the, the guns and, and are, are technically sound, um, but they're not really gunsmiths, you know, they're, they're doing some oh, part swap and repairs. Working on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's a, it's a, it's, 
it's a it's a big void uh, that yeah. we have in our industry. I mean, all the trades are suffering a bit, but certainly, I think in the gun industry, you know, real uh, gunsmiths are are very difficult to find. But uh, but again, our you know we've got positions in in all sides of the business, and uh, you know it, it's and it is even if you're not engaged in the product daily, knowing you're part of the company and part of the industry is pretty exciting. Yeah, and Terry, talk about the, uh, you've got some pretty uh, skilled trade jobs uh, uh, at Savage on the manufacturing side. And I know you and I are talking about the gunsmithing program as well. Uh, so, um, and we're working on that with, uh, with some post-secondary institutions here in Canada um, to, to see if we can make that happen. But talk a little bit about, you have 150 employees in, in Lakefield, Ontario. Talk about the type of jobs uh, that are available with you. Sure. Well, actually, you know, because it, we're ramping up so, so, so high, uh, we have 184. So, so when you were last year, I think it was about 150. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. But here we are. So, um, you know, right now we offer all levels of really transferable skills. So we have a current open position for design engineers, for CNC programmers, for CNC technicians. You know, uh, gunsmithing is is something. You know, as mentioned, is is something that's that whole technical side. You know, uh, so it's not just a matter of wanting to be interesting and, and involved with firearms. You need to know how to machine. You need to almost be the level of a general machinist. And you need to comprehend geometry in, in a machining format. And then you have to be able to troubleshoot something that needs to be signed off to the level of a safety component. So, you know, you're going to give someone back their firearm and assure that that firearm is is, is, you know, able to operate safely. So at Savage, because we are a manufacturer and a warranty depot, we are doing both that. Um, so our big needs are for those positions, as mentioned. Um, you know, we have uh, professional engineers registered in the province of Ontario. We have um, some very serious process chemicals that need to be involved. We're doing all kinds of environmental applications and modeling for air approvals because we are truly on the manufacturing side. Um, what's interesting is, as was mentioned, you know, you have to really try to chart your path. And, you know, a lot of you folks may be interested in shooting sports and graduating with a, an engineering degree or an accounting degree. And as I said, it's just, you know, you have to do the best you can at those um, skill sets and wait for opportunities and really take advantage of them. Um, we get into the high side, as Allison mentioned, on the technical side, where we're running things like coordinates measuring machines, um, programming coordinates measuring machines, um, Renishaw uh, equator. So it's very, very um um, high level math, high level geometry, because we're making parts that we, we, you know, for example, you're making parts on half a million dollar CNC machines. You know, we just, we just received the new uh, Haas. So everybody tune in on the weekend and watch Formula One and, yeah. and uh, you'll see how they afford the cars. Well, it's with half a million dollar CNC machines and we just bought one, you know, because yeah. the industry is seeing a huge high moment at this, this point in time. Yep. Um, you know, so it's terrific. I'm a lowly employee in the Canadian uh, um, shooting sports industry, um, but I got invited to uh, 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 Charleston or Charlottetown, uh, South North Carolina, I think it is, by Haas uh, to to go watch racing, go watch NASCAR. So yeah. you never yeah. know where a career in in shooting sports can lead you. Um, Adam, Western Canada. Uh, big, big market in Western Canada, lots of retailers uh, in, employing people, but uh, Corth Group is out there too. Talk a little bit about uh, what you're looking for at Corth, what types of job, and what you're seeing in Western Canada. Thanks, Allison. So we're headquartered in Western Canada, but we have a national network of sales reps that work directly for Corth Group. Um, so we have 20, 24 employees, eight of which are in sales. Um, six are commercial, one in each province, uh, and then we have two guys that focus on the military and law enforcement side of the business, uh, which is a huge growth area for us. And 
and, and Spiros would be able to speak to this as well. It's a, a big part of uh, Stoger's business is that professional side of the industry, uh, which in my opinion is a little bit more of the unique side. Uh, the, the characters and, and people involved in that are, are quite a bit different than the commercial market. Um, and it's, it's a component of this industry that is always going to be there. Um, it's absolutely a mainstay to have that, to have that side of the industry to supply product because uh, they, they need it. You know, they, they use it in their jobs and it's important that they have the right equipment to, uh, to get home safely. Um, on our side, we have warehouse staff, we have accounting staff, we have admin staff, uh, we do our own in-house marketing. We actually have optical technicians for uh, the maintenance and repair of loophole optics because we distribute loophole for Canada and we have a full optics lab set up exactly as they have at Leupold where we can we can completely service scopes uh, in-house. Um, and we're working on uh, expanding more into a gunsmithing capacity at some point here in the future as well. And, and uh, maybe Adam, I'll ask you a little bit about it because we don't have a retail representative, but, but there's also this entire network of, of uh, retailers across Canada who are employing both part-time and full-time uh, on the storefront and again in the gunsmithing uh, uh, side of it. Um, uh, lots of opportunities there too. Absolutely. And you know, there's a, a fairly large network of independent businesses that span the country. Uh, a few box store chains that remain, uh, but most of the industry, at least in our perspective, is is the independents. Um, there's hundreds of them nationally and quite a few gunsmiths. And as Spiros mentioned, we are desperately in need of legitimate gunsmiths and people that that have a, a background and training in that, that trade and that skill set, because there's a big difference between a parts exchanger and somebody that can custom build an entire firearm. Um, and we don't have a lot of gun makers in this country, and we don't have a lot of people that are at that level where they can they can properly build guns and, and offer that high level service. Yeah, and uh, just as I mentioned, the CSAAA has a committee. I see that Emily Brown is joining us today as well. Um, uh, Emily is uh, uh, working with us. Emily is a professor at Sheridan College here in Ontario, and we are in discussions with Sheridan. Uh, sort of sidetracked a little bit by the COVID shutdown, but uh, they have a full uh, skilled trades, um, beautiful, unbelievable skilled trades facility uh, in at their Brampton campus. And we are talking to them about uh, what a gunsmithing program would look like, a two-year gunsmithing program would look like in Canada. So that's something that we're definitely working on. But I do want to leave, I want to thank everybody, but I do want to leave some time. I know, David, we're a little bit over, but I want to leave some time for any questions from our attendees. Uh, if you have any questions of our panelists or any uh, questions about job opportunities or career opportunities in Canada, um, I'm not sure how the questions are being handled, so um, I don't see a chat. Is there a chat? Yeah, people can either put them in the chat or raise their hands and uh, we can unmute them. So Noah, why don't you go ahead? Uh, sure. Th hi, thanks so much. Really, really nice to meet everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Noah Schwartz uh, and I just finished my PhD in political science. So the skills that I would bring uh, would be more like writing and communication skills. So I was wondering what kind of jobs there would be for people with strong writing skills in the industry. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if Allison, you want to jump in or, or I think, you know, from a writing perspective and, and certainly in your, at your level, uh, there, there's, there's certainly the lobby side that's available, uh, but there's may, maybe not so much directly with our manufacturing, although there are key parts within our marketing departments but the writing skill you're probably looking at more in the, within the, uh, you know, from lobbying, crossing over to publishing uh, and then getting involved with magazines and even some of the TV shows and things like that. So, you know, turning it into full-time puts you really directly into something, uh, you know, around the editorial parts that certainly Allison's an expert at and could <laughs> talk to. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's what I do. So my my job, part of my job with the CSAAA is I do the government relations. And as you know, there's a lot of uh, industry and consumer associations in the sporting arms community in Canada, M maybe too many, but um, uh, so there's always <laughs> a government relations there. And I do also know that a lot of manufacturers and a lot of marketing agencies, and maybe Lee can talk to this a little bit about this, but it tends to be um, housed at the manufacturer um, are looking for digital content. Content. So, um, you know, when you are digital marketing, um, uh, that 
whole area of producing digital content, blogging, um, um, uh, Instagram, uh, all that type of, of digital marketing, uh, a lot of the manufacturers are investing in that side and are always looking for content creators. That's a growth opportunity in our category and our industry is a little bit behind on that. So it'd be interesting to see how the next generation of marketers coming into our industry um, become uh, influence that side of the industry. And I don't know if you're experiencing that on the side of your manufacturers, Lee or or Spiros or Adam, if you're seeing that. Yeah, need for yeah we, we um, <laughs> it's funny, you know, we struggle, you know, or at least, you know, our, our industry is still very old school in a lot of ways. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's, there's a, certainly an influx of new, uh, new blood in the industry. There's no question about it, but there's still a lot of old, um, old ways of doing things. And I'm not saying that they're wrong, but, you know, we're, we're starting to see the light in, in certain areas, but, you know, things like when, when products are developed in Canada, you know, as a sales representative, one of the things we always struggle with is bilingual packaging and, and making sure that manufacturers are particularly uh, US based or outside of Canada um, are well aware of the nuances in dealing with um, retail in Canada and how, how consumers um, look for goods or, or what the laws are around uh, packaging in Canada, uh, particularly when you're talking about national presence in a national uh, retailer and so on and so forth. So uh, packaging and um, you know, bilingual uh, packaging in particular is something that we're always uh, struggling to sort of uh, implement from the get-go. We, we, it's our mandate always when we're dealing with a manufacturer, if they're ever coming out with new products that they always consider doing uh, multilingual packaging wherever possible. Uh, that, that, that prevents them having to carry dual inventories and uh, making things streamlined and so on and so forth. But then on the flip side of that, to Alice, point many of the manufacturers have uh, implemented their own systems internally on how you or your dealers access um, logos or um, image imagery whether it be um, actual product shots themselves or product being used in, an, in its natural environment or its natural state um, so on and so forth so it, it, the industry's come a long way. There's still a long way to go. And uh, certainly I think there's opportunities for somebody like yourself, Noah, um, to get involved in a number of different areas that uh, your skill set would bring for sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Just, just one thing to jump in on that, Allison, that I think is, is worth exploring for anybody that's passionate about writing. Um, I sit on the board for the Outdoor Writers of Canada, and that's a, a professional group of full-time writers. Most are full time. Um, there's definitely a need for some younger writers in that capacity. Most of the the folks that write for publishing magazines, um, which whether it's their online content or their actual print media, most of, of which are retired and they're sort of at the other end of their career and they're they're well established, they're well known, they're very good at what they do. But we need a youthful voice, um, as uh, as I think Lee mentioned, that there's new blood coming into this industry all the time. Uh, we have a, a new batch of users, retail users that are younger, that didn't grow up looking at print magazines and, and looking at print catalogs. It's all been web-based. So I think there's really an opportunity for anybody passionate about writing to sort of build a bit of a reputation or a name for themselves in, in that community, which could then transition into working for a manufacturer, a rep group, or a distributor, or what have you. So... I got another question here for you guys. Um, what's one piece of advice you'd give someone who wants to get into designing or manufacturing firearms in Canada? Make sure the product is marketable in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, I, I always struggle with or I mean, like I said, we've got many factories and, and I mean, uh, and Terry would would certainly struggle it on, on his side within his own people too but uh, it's engineers like to engineer and designers love to design and to Adam's point you we often find you know them developing product or and you know developing product or items that 
nobody really wants uh, and so and or over engineering products so it's there there really needs to be a, a connection to the the end user consumer whoever that end user is so the end user and manufacturing and then the development in between you know there's typically on law enforcement military products there's a lot of uh, exchange that happens along the way Consumer products, I mean, when we think of our, our guns are really an old design uh, that we keep tweaking and, and making smoother and more efficient and, and uh, prettier, if you want to say, uh, aesthetically uh, or cosmetically. But, you, you know, it's, it's really when you're looking at designing products, is, is there a market for it? You know, first, first decide, is there a void in the market? Is there a need for it? Uh, and then work your way back from that. And then there's also, there may be a need for it, but at what price, at what cost? Uh, and so, because there, there may be a need, but you develop something that's, that's the price is so, you know, out of, out of what, what would be acceptable for something of that nature. So it's, it's, it, has to, it has to connect from the end consumer uh, to, to, to the designer and then manufacturing. Because that's the other part is, can you manufacture it uh, reasonably efficient and in volume? Uh, to make it worthwhile to commercialize. So commercialization is, is key there. So I can uh, say based on the political environment that um, creative solutions in the semi-automatic rifle field would be good right now. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, questions? I know we're at the end of our, our time frame, David. It just do we have time for one more? Or is there anybody else? Yeah, we got, we got one more here. Um, okay. What's the biggest challenge in starting a firearms or related business, financial or regulatory? Yeah, guys, I'll, I'll let you, uh, Adam or, or Lee, you guys work with retailers every day. What's, uh, what's the barriers right now? Regulation, I think, is certainly a huge part of it, but it's not overcomable. Um, um, yeah, I think uh, somebody mentioned this earlier. It might have been Spiros that mentioned it earlier, but you got to kind of come into it. If you're passionate about the outdoors, that's that's fantastic. I mean, that that's what's going to get you out of bed and drive you to do something successful in the business. But you have to be business minded. I think first and foremost, you have to be concerned about the dollars and cents and and how it, how it works and all that kind of stuff. So you got to do your due diligence. I. I strongly recommend, you know, working in the profession, um, you know, to Adam's point, I think he, he mentioned earlier that he was a, a worked for Wes uh, at Elwood Apps as, in the retail side of the business. I would strongly recommend, you know, if you're, if you're looking to open up a business that you might uh, first get your feet wet and uh, maybe, maybe uh, try and find a job uh, in the retail sector, get a flavor for it. Uh, see how some people do the business uh, firsthand and how you might do it a little bit differently. Um, that would be my recommendation. It's a tough business. There's no question about it. Um, uh, we're in a very enviable uh, point of time right now with um, demand for our product that we've never seen in, in many, many years um, that I've been involved in it. Um, it's just been astronomical to Terry's point you know, you can't place an order now and, and receive it until sometime at the end of the 2022 for, for a new Savage uh, Rimfire uh, rifle. It's just, it's just unprecedented times that we're going through right now. So it, it's a great time to be involved in the business. I mean, we've, we've weathered some storms in the past um, and, and we're, in a, we're in a very enviable time right now, but it's also a very uh, strong time for participants in the outdoor, getting more involved in, in the business, getting more involved in the activity. People that may have gotten away from the outdoors and hunting have kind of come back into it because they've got time, they've got some maybe some, some money that they might have, may have uh, set aside for holidays and stuff like that. They haven't been able to do that now. So that sort of pushed people back into the sport and getting involved in the outdoors locally, which is fantastic for us. But my recommendation would be to get your feet wet um, and maybe get some experience first before you um, sort of decided to open up a business and, and then do it right. Yeah, and I think just looking at our members and our members who succeed, uh, it's important to remember that it is a business 
And um, the companies like the, the panelists that we have here today aren't just looking for passion, they're looking for education and relevant education. Uh, um, so it's not just a matter of, hey, I love shooting, I'm gonna open a retail shop. You need business admin uh, education. You need, our businesses, this is, um, this is an easier time for them because we're booming, uh, but they have had to do some real pivoting and really make really smart business decisions as we've faced regulatory challenges in our industry. So it's not enough just to be a good shooter. You have to be, uh, also good at the core function of either running a business or being an engineer or um, being an accountant. Um, so education, you, you can't just come into this with passion. You got to come into it with education as well. And David, I think a little over our time. So I want to thank uh, our panelists for joining us today and thank all of you who were uh, uh, attending and interested. And yeah, we're csaa.org. And um, if you want to take a look or if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. And I'm happy to connect you with business owners in your area. Um, and we will keep everyone posted on the gunsmithing situation, which we are hoping to have resolved. So um, and have something launched in the next uh, year and a half or so. David, thank you so much for hosting us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a ton for coming out, sharing your wisdom. All right, enjoy thanks the rest very much. Of thank thanks, you. everybody. Hey. Take care. Cheers, guys. So now, yeah, we got a uh, five minute break here, guys, and then we'll have uh, Earl Green, who's a uh, pistol trainer, um, about his experience um, in the world of pistol sport shooting.
All right, guys. Um, yeah, next up, we have Earl Green. He's a, uh, the owner of Faceline Green um, Tactical. And uh, yeah, he's a competitive pistol shooter, um, spent some time in law enforcement, and I'll, I'll let him take it away and uh, tell you the rest. Well, good morning. How's everybody today? So um, what I'm going to do here is I'm having a, I don't know what's going on. I'm having a slight Zoom problem. Uh, but let me see what we can do for you here. I just wanted to, uh, I was going to actually share a video to start with, but uh, unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, we're uh, not going to be able to give you the video. That being said, we are going to give you a quick PowerPoint today. And uh, that should work out well for us. So uh, I'll just, uh, I'll start with a little bit about me. Um, so basically I'm a small town kid and uh, like many of you, I'm just a normal guy. Um, I've, had, uh, I've had some great experiences in my time. I grew up just outside of uh, Ottawa and I started shooting when I was about six years old. My dad got me into shooting 22s and a little bit of shotgun. I used to hunt with him and uh, those types of things. And then when I was about 14, my dad and a couple of his friends decided they would take me out and, and teach me about pistol and revolver shooting. And, and I kind of got hooked on it. And uh, so I've been shooting pistols pretty much since I was about 14 years old. And I'm going to be honest with you, when I first started, uh, I wasn't that great. And that's one of the things that you'll find about pistol shooting. Pistol shooting is definitely a, um, it's a sport that involves a really good grasp of fundamentals to get good at it. That being said, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that it, uh, it, it can probably be the most fun that, that you'll ever have. Um, so anyway, I'm a university graduate. I graduated from Carleton University. I'm not going to tell you when, let's just say that I'm old. Um, my, uh, my undergrad is in law and uh, criminology with a concentration in criminal justice policy. So when, as soon as I finished university, in fact, while I was in university, I was hired by two police services. I was hired by Peel Regional Police and I was hired by the Ontario Provincial Police at the same time. And I chose to go with the Ontario Provincial Police because it would um, kind of expand my horizons and, and I thought that there was much, uh, much more opportunity to move forward. So joined the OPP and I promptly got sent to Northern Ontario where I spent about four years of my career. And uh, then I tried out for the tactics and rescue program and was successful. Uh, I spent a couple of years with the program and then I went back to detachment for a while and eventually made it into in-service training. Um, and I got into in-service training because of my, uh, my background in, in, in martial arts and self-defense, but as well my shooting background. Um, I was at a training session and was kind of picked out of the group and, and one of the, the sergeant in charge said, hey, you've got to try this out. Uh, we really want to have you come on board. So I, I ended up into in-service training and although at the beginning I focused strictly on, on use of force and, and self-defense, uh, I ended up moving over to the specialized training program and doing pretty much firearms all the time for about four years. And uh, so I shot every day for four years. And at the same time, though, I was a competitive shooter. And I started competition shooting in about 1995. Um, a bunch of guys at my, at my gun club were, uh, were interested in IPSC. And there was a, I was at Barry Gun Club at the time. And there was a huge IPSC following. And if you don't know what IPSC is, it's the International Practical Shooting Confederation. So it's worldwide. And it, it focuses on speed and accuracy. Um, and it was just a lot of fun. And I was, I really got into it initially to augment my shooting as a police officer. Um, that being said, I've never had to use it. But on the other side of it, uh, it just became my, my hobby. And it was one of the most fun things that I could do. So as time moved on, I ended up, I left uh, the OPP and I got into nuclear security where I was also a trainer. And um, so I was doing a lot, a lot of training and pro, um uh, lesson plan development for them. And then eventually I left that and returned to the Ottawa area and managed security actually at Algonquin College for about 10 years. Now, here's the funny thing is because of my shooting background and because of my, my law enforcement knowledge and the experiences that I had there, I was actually head on to, to be the director of business development for the Sparland Group. And Sparland Group, if you're not aware of it, is probably one of the largest 
producers of law enforcement and, and military armor, duty gear, holsters, uh, bomb disposal equipment, um, you name it, we, we produce it for military and law enforcement. And so I'm a, one of our guys for Canada and I'm the Canada is my region that I'm responsible for. All that being said, so I got into Safari Land Group because of shooting. And, and that's kind of the cool thing about shooting that, that some of you will find is that you can turn it into a career. Now, here's the funny thing. When you turn it into a career, one of the things I found is that even though I play with holsters every day, sadly, I don't get to shoot as much as I did prior to that. And of course, with COVID, as you guys know, uh, it's kind of affected that a little bit. So let's get on to, to talking about competitive shooting, because I know you're, you're kind of like, yeah, whatever, dude, and like, move on with it. So uh, can you guys actually see my screen or no? Yeah, we can, we can see you, and you should be able to share it now as well if you want. Well, that's interesting, because I'm having, let's see if it'll do it here. Let's try this. How about now? Have you got my screen now? Oh, I'm seeing thumbs up. Okay, coolio. All right, so uh, where we're at here. So anyway, uh, as I was saying, I'm still trying to get my mouse to work here. My mouse is, there we go. All right, so moving on. So what can you do with pistol shooting? Well, check this out. So this is, believe it or not, a lot of my experience with pistol shooting. And if you look at, at what I got going on here is, you know, the center picture, I was actually on uh, the Ontario production team. This is, I believe, about 10 years ago. And all of those folks that are in that picture in the middle are actually good friends of mine. And, and they're from all walks of life. And so it's kind of interesting when you see the people that are there. There's actually a college student. There is a, she's, one of them is now a nurse. The other one is a dog groomer. There's a funeral director there. There's a, a two retired gentlemen. Uh, and there's a guy that's a gunsmith. And of course, there's that great looking fellow on the right that, that's me. Top left, that's actually me teaching a, a low light course. And again, some individuals that had come out with their handguns to learn how to shoot in, in low light conditions. Uh, and many of those people actually were not, uh, were not military or law enforcement. They were civilians, just like we are. So uh, that's kind of the interesting thing with that. And then if you look way over on the on the right side of your screen, you'll see that there's there's a, a steel match that I was shooting, and that's actually at EOSC here in, in Ottawa. And uh, that's one of the funnest things going. And then, of course, you see a target display at the bottom, which is from a, a course that I, I taught out in Alberta. And then, of course, down in the, in the lower left corner, there's me shooting an IDPA match right here in Smith Falls. So really, there's a lot that you can do with handgun shooting and, and it's funny because people will say well i'm only stuck with shooting on an approved range yeah sure um but here's the thing there's quite a number of great approved ranges around so there's um in ontario anyway there, there's numerous ones alberta has some great ones bc has some great ones um and and depending on where you are i mean even in, in nova scotia there's a, a few good ranges that are within driving of pretty much anywhere in nova scotia quebec has some limited offerings but, but that being said, if you look around, you'll find the places that you want to go to to shoot. Um, so again, there is quite a bit that, that you can actually do. Now, here's the thing, is one of the things that I find is when you give someone a, any type of firearm and they're not experienced with firearms, they, they, you're kind of, it's almost like putting someone behind the wheel of a car and saying, okay, drive, and they've never driven before. It, you've really got to spend some time working with that person. And, and I, I did this one in red because here's the thing. Firearm safety is tantamount with every particular firearm that you use, but I'm going to say this, it's even, I guess, more poignant with, with a handgun. And the reason why I say that is if you hand someone a handgun and they've never picked one up before, the very first thing that you'll see is their finger goes onto the trigger. And because, <clears throat> pardon me, and because of a, a pistol is a shorter firearm, I also see people that for some odd reason they'll end up pointing it at themselves or at someone that they don't intend to, um, you know, or pointing it at a wall, not thinking that most walls are really only sheetrock and, and, and two by four studs, and therefore a handgun can go through them. One of the key things to remember is, I, I, and I, tell, I teach this on my courses, is, is a, every firearm is like a, a rattlesnake. And what I mean is that 
you know, you can handle snakes and, and carry them and do all kinds of things, but eventually you're going to get bit if you don't use caution. So one of the things is I, I treat every gun that I pick up, even if I've just cleared it, I treat it like it's loaded, which means I'm worried that it's going to go off and it's going to go off and it's going to damage someone or something that I don't want to. So fair enough, then I put these other rules into, um, into play so that I avoid that. So the next rule, obviously, is if I don't want to put a hole in myself or someone that I like or dislike or my dog or my wall or my television, then I don't point the gun at it. So I don't point the gun at anything that I'm not willing to destroy or kill. And, and that's one of the key things. And I use the word kill there because it's a it's a strong word. And I know for many people, it's an important word and it should be. But that tells you the seriousness of, of what you're doing is you're dealing with something that can kill. Now, here's the funny thing. So can your car. So I'm pretty sure when you drive, you drive with due care and attention so that number one, you don't kill anyone else. And number two, you don't kill yourself. Um, and that's one of the things to remember is that now you've got it. And a car really is a large projectile. So when I look at this, I've got an implement, a, a barreled implement that is capable of emitting a projectile. That's really the, the definition of a firearm. And it can kill. So, so I keep that in mind. I never point it at anything that I don't want to shoot. And then most guns, unless there's something wrong with them, will not go off unless you pull the trigger. So how do I activate the trigger? I use my finger. Well, here's the thing. I keep my finger off the trigger until my sights are on my identified target and I intend to shoot. So what I mean is that uh, when I shoot competitively, whenever I'm doing magazine changes or I'm doing draws and or I'm coming into targets and I'm not ready to shoot yet, my finger is actually nowhere near the trigger. It's actually on the frame of the gun. So it's off the trigger. It's pointed along the frame of the gun. And, and again, that way I can avoid an accidental discharge or a sympathetic reflex discharge, which means if you think about this, if I trip and I go to fall, one of the things that you see people do, they'll either open their hands or if they're holding something, they'll crush down on it because they don't want to drop it, especially with a handgun. If I've got my finger on the trigger and I close my fist, gun goes off. Sympathetic reflex. Now, if I'm lucky, it hits the berm or it hits, you know, a prop or something like that and it doesn't hit anyone. But here's the thing. There have been accidents in competitive shooting where someone has been shot because they had their finger on the trigger when they were doing something they shouldn't have. So reholstering, magazine changes, clearing a malfunction, those types of things. So keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on your target and you intend to shoot. And here's another one, beware of your target. And, and if I, I know everybody here is pretty much a firearms enthusiast, there was a video going around uh, YouTube, I believe it was about six months to a year ago of a gentleman who was shooting a stage in an IPSC match. And there was a guy down, down range patching targets. So the scary thing about that is, is that he could have shot someone inadvertently um, by shooting through a target. And, and so one of the things that you, you need to be aware of is, okay, first of all, if I'm shooting targets on a range, I know what my target is, right? Usually I know it's a steel target or it's a paper target. Well, then what's behind it? So here's the funny thing. I've, and it, it, this actually happened to me on a course. We were shooting targets and the rounds were going through the target. They were paper targets. And the rounds are going through and they're hitting the sand on the berm. And a guy turns to me and says, wow, that's neat. And I said, what's neat? And he goes, I didn't realize that the bullets would like go through the paper and, and hit the dirt. And that, now I thought about, okay, well, I could have said something really sarcastic and I didn't, but I said, maybe you need to rethink about your shooting because they're only shooting through paper. And it was the most bizarre statement I've ever heard. But the scary thing is many people think that that round, when it hits the paper, it terminates, it disintegrates and it doesn't go anywhere. The fact of the matter is it doesn't. It's got to stop somewhere. Uh, so that's something else to be, to be mindful of. And of course, what may be in, in front of it. I actually had this happen where I was shooting in a match and I was moving fairly quickly and I, I moved into a position I shot and I went to move and I realized I had a miss on one target and I stopped immediately and I swung to my right and the RO was actually running, trying to keep up with me, almost ran in front of the muzzle of my gun. So I pulled the muzzle away and, and I, I was safe. But the scary thing was, is that if I had not been, you know, thinking about where I was shooting and what I was shooting at, I could have inadvert inadvertently shot an RO. And really, the fault would have been all mine, not his, because I should know not to pull the trigger when someone's moving. So when it comes to fire, pistols especially, firearm safety is probably your number one and tantamount rule. 
So it, it is something that you need to keep in, in, in your mind the entire time that you handle a pistol. So let's get that boring stuff out of the way. Let's talk about the fundamentals. Here's a funny thing. Some people will say, hey, you know what? I know because I've, I've shot pellet guns or I've shot airsoft or whatever that I'm really, really good with a pistol. Okay, you might be really, really good. And in fact, I've seen a lot of folks, um, especially recently, that have come up through Airsoft and are good pistol shooters. Um, and they're quick and they move quick. And, and I'll tell you what, some of them are probably in this group today because um, I think there's people here today that I've actually shot with or I've taught. And the interesting thing is there are some fundamentals to put into play that will allow you to become an even better shooter. So the first one is stance. So what's our stance look like? And if you look at the, the cool looking cat over on the left there, um, you, your stance really is, a, is more of a relaxed stance. You want your knees to be slightly flexed. You want your weight to be slightly forward over your toes. And, and as well, when you present the, the pistol, you want the pistol to come out. You don't need your arms fully extended. My arms, you can't see them because I'm wearing a, a black shirt there. But in that particular picture, my arms are actually slightly flexed which allows when I fire the pistol, allows the recoil or the slide reciprocating to kind of use my arms as shock absorbers and keep the pistol relatively flat. Now, here's the thing. It's not just my arms doing that. If you look at picture number two, where I talk about grip, there's the grip that you want. You see my thumbs are pointing forward towards the target. Uh, I'm actually pushing my thumbs into the side of the firearm. My hands, when I grip the gun, you'll hear people talk about, oh, I do a 60-40 or I do a cascading grip or whatever. Um, I don't do a 60-40 grip myself. Um, I'm almost a 100-100. In other words, I'm sandwiching the gun into my hand. I'm making, making maximum use of the grip and the texture of the grip on the, the meat of my thumb and the palm of my, my hand. So I'm a right-handed shooter, and you can see here with my right hand, um, which is not visible to you other than my thumb, is it's flat up against the grip of the gun. My, my trigger finger, if you can actually see it behind, is up on the frame of the gun because I'm not intending to shoot at this point in time. But then if you look at how my left hand is, the, the meat of my thumb and the palm of my hand are pushing against the, the, the grip. And you can, you can tell from that picture just how much tension is in my thumbs because they're kind of a little bit uh, more red or dark. And I use what's called a wedge. Is a, if you look at my left index finger, it's wedged up against the bottom of the trigger guard. And my wrist is slightly bent so that when the recoil comes in on this grip, the gun's not going to flip up and down. It's actually going to stay pretty flat, um, flat straight back. And you can actually see that if you look way over to the right, there's a, a picture of a pistol in, in full recoil. And if you note, it, it, it's risen slightly. And that's for you physics guys and engineers. Obviously, it's got to unlock, which means something's got to give. So the, the, in this particular case, as the gun is reciprocating, the barrel is unlocking, which means it's dropping down out of its lugs because it's riding on a cam within the gun. But if you look at that, he's actually holding that gun really, really flat. That's not me. That's a, again, that's a nine millimeter, which is a relatively soft shooting pistol. But if you look at that particular picture, because of his grip and how it is, he's very high up on the gun, the gun's gonna stay relatively flat. So, before we get to our trigger press though, what's our sight alignment look? And I gave you that picture. In this particular case, he's taking a front sight focus or she's taking a front sight focus, pardon me. Um, and in this particular picture, this person is actually focusing on the front sight, although it's not really defined within the picture. Normally, I focus on the front sight. Now here's the thing, you can play a little game. How many things can the human eye focus on at once? One, um, it, especially in clarity. So what do I want if I'm shooting a gun and I want to make sure that I've got a really, really solid and accurate shot? Well, I'm going to focus on the front sight more than I'm going to focus on the rear and more than I'm going to focus on the target. So you can do what's called sight gears. And sight gears are basically this. I look at the target. The target's in solid focus. As soon as the, the pistol comes up to my eye, I flip my focus onto the front sight. I line up the top of the front sight, even with the top of the back sight, equal light on both sides of the front sight. I have a good, sharp focus on that front sight. Target will be blurry, backside will be blurry, and I press the trigger. <coughs> Pardon me. I don't use the term. Now, here's a funny thing about pistol shooting. Pistol shooting is actually a mental game, too. In fact, most shooting is a mental game. And so when I talk about press, I don't talk about pull because a pull is like starting a lawnmower. If you've, if you've got one of those ripcord lawnmowers, you take the slack out of it and you rip it through. 
A press is almost like working the button in an elevator. I don't get in and I slap the thing with my finger. I take it and I press it gently. So in the same, as much as you are, are kind of, I, I guess, pulling a trigger to the rear, I use it as a press. In other words, I'm using my finger to press the trigger straight to the rear so that that minimizes left to right movement and ensures that the gun stays tracked straight onto the target and fires somewhere within that, that movement. Now, what will happen is that it'll come up, it'll, it'll what we do what we call stacking. In other words, it'll get to the break point and then you just press straight through the break point and that's kind of your stop before the trigger releases. And then we've got to go through follow through because some people will, will snap that trigger and release. And here's the funny thing. <laughs> you can actually snap and release the trigger fast enough that it, it affects the round in the barrel. And what I mean by that is that you can actually be moving the gun before the gun has, has actually fired and settled. It, it's kind of wild. Um, and people go, oh, that's ridiculous. It's only four inches and the round is traveling at 900 feet per second. Um, you can still mess up. And that's where you mess up is usually at that particular point is when you press the trigger, especially if you've got what, an anticipation or a flinch. I got news for you. You've all got a flinch and, and the flinch exists to protect your eyes. If I threw a punch at you, you'd probably close your eyes. Um, you know, or if I threw sand in your face, you'd close your eyes. Same thing. You've got an explosion going on in front of you because that's what it is. It's an explosion that's pushing a projectile down a barrel. And, and really, you're not used to that. None of us are. So we have to control that flinch. So it's either through I focus on press, press, press while I'm looking at the front sight, or I focus on front sight, front sight, front sight, or I focus on press, press, press as I'm, I'm pressing the trigger. And then lastly is, is the follow through where I allow the sights to come back into that notch and settle back on the target to see if I need to do a follow-up shot. In competitive shooting, I, some, I usually do need to do at least two shots on target. Uh, in some cases in, and in some competitions, you'll see three shots or four shots or, or things like that. So, so again, that, those are the, the fundamentals of pistol shooting. I got news for you. I, I dry fire every day. I've always got a gun in my hand. Sometimes I'm on the phone talking, not on Zoom calls because that freaks people out. But I'll have a, a gun in my hand and I'll be pressing the trigger. And I and every evening I do about 15 to 20 minutes of, of trigger press. And honestly, I, I shoot, I don't shoot now as much as I used to, but I shoot about 15 to 20,000 rounds a year. And I find that I'm always working on fundamentals because much like any other sport, your fundamentals are what makes it. So whether it's hockey, volleyball, you know, soccer, you name it, it's those fundamentals that are, are going to, to, you know, help you when the crunch comes because your mind automatically goes to that and goes to what subconsciously it knows how to do. So you become, when you first start, you're going to be consciously incompetent. We all were, we all are. When you first started driving a car, you were consciously incom incompetent riding a bike. You knew you were going to fall over and you did. Then you become actually scary about this. Some people are at the very beginning are unconsciously incompetent. In fact, I've had people tell me, in fact, I had a guy say this to me one time at a range. He goes, you know what? I can, I shoot Coke cans at 50 meters all day long with a 45. One-handed. And I said, there's no way. So guess what? I produced a 45 and he decided he didn't want to shoot. Uh, I don't shoot Coke cans at 50 yards. I can hit a Coke can at 50 yards, but not with one hand. I got to hold on to it with two hands and I got to really focus on all these fundamentals. Same thing as you folks that play soccer. You want to put the ball in the top right corner of the net. You've got to spend a lot of time just kicking in a straight line and figuring out how you can curve a ball or how you can not curve a ball or how you can make the ball go where you want it to. It, it's just like any other sport. And these are the fundamentals of this particular sport. So next slide. Do you need an instructor? Well, I'll tell you what, these are people that I've, I've had instruct me and I've instructed with. And if you don't know who these guys are, um, the, the question becomes one of, you know, do I need an instructor? Yes, you do. Because for all of us, we don't know what we don't know. And, and every instructor has a different take on things. And there's some great instructors out there. If you look over at the left is actually the legend. That's Robbie Latham. And Robbie Latham has been shooting since the 80s. He's still one of the top shooters in the United States. He's a good friend of mine and a phenomenally nice guy. You look at picture number two, Jerry Mikulik. We all know who Jerry is. He's one of the fastest revolver shooters in the world, if not the fastest revolver shooter in the world. And he's actually a very nice guy. 
Jerry and his family are great people and I've taken some instruction from him. And the other guy that looks really nasty there, that's Larry Vickers. And I'm friends with Larry Vickers. And in fact, at one time, I was the only Vickers shooting method instructor in, the can in Canada because I had learned from Larry and, and I was teaching carbine and handgun based on, on his package. And I learned a lot from that package. But I also took from other instructors that I'd worked with and then went all the way over to the right. And if you see, that's Jeff Bluvman. And Jeff Bluvman runs a company called Practically Tactical in the States. He's one of the top pistol shooters and top pistol instructors in the United States. And it was an honor to actually be asked by Jeff. I was in Pennsylvania and he asked, would you like to instruct a two-day course with me? And I did. And I'll tell you what, I learned more from, from actually teaching on that course than I had really from teaching on my own. So, you know, do you need an instructor? We all need an instructor. And in fact, I run a shooting company, as I mentioned, and I shoot every well, I, I take a course, at least one course every year, and I try to mix it up. And I've taken courses from some Canadian instructors as well who are very good, and I'll talk about those later on. Um, but there are some good people out there, and, and you need to go and get shooting instruction if you want to get good. There's always more to learn, um, and every course has good and bad to it. I always take notebooks, and I make notes all the way through these things. And, and it just helps me out because I take the notes and I turn them into lesson plans later on, or I turn them into training plans for myself as to what did I like? What do I want to work on? Um, and then I, I go away with that. And somebody who's not in these pictures is Ben Stoger, who's also one of the top shooters in the United States, good friend of mine. And, and I shot with Ben. And, and interestingly enough, too, is that I want to point out to you guys, I've been a sponsored shooter. So I've shot for Beretta. And I think Beretta is one of our sponsors here today. <clears throat> I shot for Beretta for about two years. I also shot for SIG, but not as a sponsored shooter. I was actually a jump instructor for six hour um, back when in my nuclear uh, protection days, because I had been on a course and they actually recruited me out of the course. Interesting thing was every time I taught, I taught with some of the top instructors in the world and I learned a ton. And, and really, I'm still in touch with most of those people. And, and still learn from them and we learn from one another. So there's really always more to learn. You're always gonna be a student. It's, you know, you folks that are into martial arts, it's the same thing. Um, every time you go to a different dojo or you go to a different competition or, you know, you take up a different discipline, there's tons of stuff to learn and it's always different. So let me see if I can get the next slide. So where do I go for instructors? Well, you can ask at your range. Uh, and, and also the, the biggest one is word of mouth. And I guess for you folks that, that are here today, you know, if, if you want to find me, it, it's Earl, you know, Earl at phaselinegreentactical.ca. And I can point you, and I'm not looking for business, by the way, I'm pointing, I'm, I'm telling you this because you contact me and you tell me where you live, I will find you a good instructor. And this is one of the things is that there's a lot of instructors out there. You know, it's the biggest it's really become the biggest money maker uh, in the shooting industry is instruction. And I would say there are probably maybe 15 to 20% that are worth going to. Um, and, and you've got to look at something. Do, you know, do I want to come back it is the big one. I've seen people walk away from shooting just because of an instructor or just because of how they were treated at a, at a competition. So right across Canada, there are some great instructors. Um, in fact, most of the people that teach the Black Badge course for uh, IPSC in Canada, and you have to have the Black Badge course in order to compete in, in IPSC, almost every one of those instructors is a phenomenal guy and a, and, or gal and a phenomenal shooter. And, and I apologize when I stumble, the majority of instructors out there are, are male, but there are some really, really good female instructors out there and some phenomenal female shooters out there as well. And and it's just one of those things where you've really got to look around and you've got to see who fits for you. And some of the things that I always look at is, so what does this guy know? Uh, where did he get his knowledge from? And I look at people, you know, Robbie Latham, never a police officer, never served in the military, but he's been a competitive shooter since the 80s and has learned more from that experience than anything else. So I always look at their experience. And I got news for you. I, just recently, I was contacted by actually a, another law enforcement guy who's starting his company and he was sending me pictures and videos of, you know, this is my instruction. And I went, I wouldn't go there. And I wouldn't go there because he didn't have a proper grasp of the fundamentals and he really wasn't working with the shooters to teach them good fundamentals. And I went, what's your experience? Your experience is only law enforcement. Your experience is not competitive shooting and it's not, 
It's not from anything else or hunting or wherever you got it from. Um, and, and really, I, I look at what is that person's knowledge? What's their experience? And are they patient? <laughs> For example, you know, are they going to are they going to call me names? OK, if you take a course with me, I'm going to call you names, but it's going to be funny because it's it's to break the ice. And it's honestly, I wait until I have figured out what you're like, because if you're really struggling, there's no point in having someone yell at you or give you a hard time or single you out or make fun of you. Interestingly enough, when I went on Robbie Latham's course, Robbie Latham's course was what's called a, a cerebral course. And in that course, Robbie spent a lot of time working with individual shooters and pointing out what they were doing wrong, but he would do it for the whole group. And you never felt like you were being singled out and ridiculed. He would go, okay, here's, watch this, watch what this guy does, or watch what this gal does. Okay, see what they're doing here? This is great, but they need to change this to fix that. And it works. And then again, look at their background. How many other courses have they taught? And have they only taught a certain type of shooting? Uh, and again, there's there's some good up and comers in Canada and there's some great people uh, who to look for in, in Canada. There's a lot of, of tactical shooting going on in Canada right now, which, by the way, is, is some of the there's some great instructors in that, you know, Veritat Global at West. Uh, I look here in, in Ontario. Believe it or not, I can't think of anybody right off the top of my head. Um, there's guys here in this area. Steve Russell out at EOSC is one of the best. Um, Practical shooting instructors. There's great practical and shooting instructors over at, uh, at Eastern uh, East Elgin, which is over by London. Uh, and there's some really good people in that area. There's some good people actually around Trenton that are teaching. I think Ragnarok Tactical. They're they're not bad. And, and uh, WGT Consulting that's over there. Uh, his background is law enforcement. And, and again, he's got some. He's actually got a guy on staff that's an airsofter, who's a great shooter, and he's got great fundamentals that he developed from Airsoft. So you got to look at where the guy started from it. And I'll tell you what, I would go to those guys. And, and again, there's another guy in Toronto. Um, I think it's break, break precision, break tactical, uh, Mike break, who's an ex ETF guy from Toronto. Now I, I know that there's a lot of people who don't like law enforcement people right now. I got news for you. 99% of the law enforcement people are good people. That being said, if that turns you off, don't, don't go there. But some of these guys have a wealth of knowledge and will treat you very, very well. So again, and, and if you reach out to me, I'll find someone in your area and we can we can help you. Now, do you need an RPAL? It helps. Um, and getting your RPAL, there's tons of companies out there that, that offer them. But you've got to remember that pistols are a restricted weapon, they, or a restricted firearm, pardon me, and can only be shot on an approved shooting range. If you don't have an RPAL, you have to be under the direct supervision of someone with an RPAL. And I, this, that wasn't the crux of my conversation today, but it is, it, it's something that you may want to look into. And then, of course, what's the equipment like? Well, you need to budget here, gang. And my thought is this, buy once, cry once. When it comes to handguns, there's lots of places now and there's lots of folks that you'll find that will allow you to try different handguns. And I would suggest that you do that because we all have different hand strength, different, different hand sizes. Uh, the good news is many of the of the, the mainstream firearms out there now can be um, scaled. The grips can be scaled to fit your hand. Uh, but again, you want to figure out what feels good for you and, and you know what presents naturally for you when you basically you just pu push it forward to see what it does. Then if you're going to get into competitive shooting, don't wear a dress belt. Buy yourself a good sturdy belt, uh, a two-ply belt. There's all kinds of them out there. You're going to need a half-decent holster, one that covers the trigger guard. The one in the bottom right corner is one of our Safari Land holsters. That holster itself, believe it or not, is only about 35 bucks uh, US, so it's about 50 bucks Canadian. Uh, and there's a, a number of good companies like Gray Fox Strategic, uh, Comtac, that are producing Kydex holsters that are in the range of about 55 bucks, and they're going to work for you. A couple of mag pouches, usually about, depending on what you're doing, if it's IDPA, you only need two. If it's IPSEC, you're going to need about five or six. Cleaning equipment, of course, so that you keep your gun clean. Eye and ear protection. And again, I'm, I'm a big proponent of buy once, cry once. Buy the best hearing protection you can afford. Buy the best eye protection you can afford. And I don't mean, you know, go and buy Ray-Bans with a glass lens. Buy something with a polycarbonate lens. It's got the best visual acuity you can get. And a range bag. And guess what? 
A range bag can be as simple as a gym bag or it can be a, a knapsack or something like that. I prefer the, the, the backpack type bags now because it makes it much easier when I'm walking around at, at shooting competitions to drag everything around just by throwing it on my back. So again, and, and you know what, get out there and shop. But you've got to look at what are your budgetary considerations and shooting can be expensive. So what's the, you know, and budget well. So what's my firearm going to cost? What's my gear going to cost? Ammunition. How much do I intend on shooting? Do I reload or not? And, and I'll tell you what, if you reload, <coughs> there's a cost at the, at the outset, but it gets offset pretty quickly. And then we look at what, how am I going to store it? I, I need to have some type of, of safe that is either you know, fixed and bolted into something or it can be hidden, but it's got to secure that firearm and, and it, it's got to be there. And then there's range fees and then there's organizational fees. So if I join IDPA, it's, you know, 50 bucks a year. If I join IPSC, it's 85 bucks a year, I think. And, and i is 30 bucks and, and those types of things. So, so you've got to budget all of this out, but don't let it scare you away. Save your money over time, you know, it, and it, it really, it can be as expensive as you want. When I was shooting competitively, I was spending $35,000 a year when I was really, really good. And all of my ammo was supplied. Now, I don't spend anywhere near that. I, I'm, you know what? I'm probably a couple of thousand bucks a year, and that's probably mostly ammunition. And remember, I shoot a lot. So that's the big thing. And some of it is, is travel and range fees and, and that type of thing. So, so who can I join? IPSC, IDPA. I-Corps, Three Gun Nation, those are the big ones for handguns in Canada. I-Corps is actually for revolvers only. Um, I, I've shot a few I-Corps matches. I'm, I'm not a revolver shooter. I was when I was a young cop, but uh, then I went away from it and stuck strictly with, with auto pistols. IPSC is uh, the biggest organ shooting organization in the world. Um, and it is a ton of fun. And it's all action shooting, it's moving, it's, it's different scenarios. Same as IDPA, IDPA is drawing from concealment, using cover, uh, different scenarios, that type of thing. i is very similar and so is Three Gun Nation. And Three Gun Nation is handgun, shotgun, uh, rifle or carbine. Okay, that brings us to the end of that. So I'm gonna go back if I can get, uh, if I can stop my share here. Oh, look, it's that. All right, so here we are, we're back. Now, that brings me to the end of what I had, uh, and I'm just wondering, do, do any of you guys have any questions that I can help you out with that, you know, we can maybe, we've got a few minutes here. I think we've got about three or three to five. Um, what would you like to, to ask? Is there anything that we can, uh, we can maybe cover here that I didn't cover? Wow, tough crowd. By the way, I see my friend Nico is here today. Hi, Nico. How are you? Excellent to see. He's taking a course with me. So, yes, sir. Can we unmute him, Dave? Yeah, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Hi, guys. Great to see you. Earl, thank you for what you said. How, how, is, the, um, how is the context right now for courses, training? Well... Believe it or not, there's an appetite. The sad part is, is, is with the constant lockdowns, uh, yes, it's affecting business. Um, interestingly enough, we're also seeing both banks and insurance companies that are, are refusing to do business with firearms companies. And it's just because of, of the current flavor, I guess, towards firearms. And I, I, you know what? I think the pendulum is going to swing the other way. Um, I'm, I've put my, my course calendar on hold because the lockdowns keep affecting registrations. I, but I, I can say this, in the last three weeks, now that the weather's gotten nice, I've had over 300 inquiries about when are you going to teach? And I was like, wow, that usually I get about 100 around this time of year, but I've got so many people that are contacting me. And I, I think it's an actual, it's an industry that's growing. Um, and, and right now, ammunition sales, as you know, are, are a bit difficult, but really it hasn't, we haven't seen that impact in the Canadian market. So you know what? It, it, it's interesting because it's it's a very um, it's a fast growing industry and it's still growing. And I think what we're going to see as time goes on is again that pendulum is going to swing the other way because we're getting a lot more younger people are getting involved. Um, and and you know why we're here today? Many many post secondary and university students are very interested in getting into it. So it, it's there. 
And I see, uh, I see actually Emily, I see Emily Brown has a question there over in the corner. Hi, Emily. Uh, can we unmute Emily? And Thanks, Nico, by the way. Thank you. I don't take well to being muted, but <laughs> thanks, no, Rob. <laughs> I've just sent you a connection on LinkedIn as well. But, oh, nice. Um, okay, great. Yeah, it's it's not lost on me that today's May 1st, and we now are mourning the one year passing from the Order and Council uh, gun ban, and also um, Bill C-71 uh, and 21, where we're looking at potential handgun bans being passed over to municipal hands. So. Uh, I'm currently seeking the um, nomination to run as the federal conservative candidate in the Burlington riding. And I want to know what uh, your involvement is um, and what message you send to those who you instruct and those who you are still in touch with. Absolutely. Well, here's the funny thing. So I'll be, I'll be completely honest with you. I am a card carrying member of the conservative party um, as well. Uh, I am a member of CCFR. And my main reason for being a member of CCFR is the, the image of the organization and the people that are involved in the organization, and especially, I, I know Rob and I know Tracy personally as well, and, and I got news for you, I, you can't find a group that, that has better people in it, who have a passion for, for what we're doing and have a passion for getting information out there. And Emily, as you know, I think that with, with you know, Bill C-10, there, there's an attempt to throttle um, even free discourse when it comes to, to putting out political messages from particular parties. And it, it, it's not as, you know, the, it's completely transparent what's, what's transpiring here. So my thought on this and, and my thing too, you know, my message to, to the people that I instruct is you need to be involved and you've got to join organizations. And you've got to join organizations because those organizations do provide information. Those organizations also provide a... Um, a very common platform. And, and one of the other things too, is that they're speaking out. I mean, you know, I'm also a supporter of, of the current challenge uh, against C-71 because I look at it and, and I look at myself with the firearms that I own, I, I stand to lose about $60,000, if not more. Um, but, but that being said, that, that's just me personally, when it comes to other people, there's no need for it. And, and I'm speaking as a, as a former law enforcement uh, officer. And also, I'm, I'm currently still a third, uh, certified uh, workplace violence and, and post-secondary violence threat assessor. There's no need for it because statistically, firearms aren't being used in the commission of an offense to, to any great degree by lawful owners. Um, and in fact, when you look at the statistics, it's, I believe it's less than 1%. So we aren't the problem. Yet it seems that the focus of, of the, the current liberal government is, is to punish people that aren't doing things wrong and then take a hug a thug mentality towards the people that are doing things wrong. I mean, I, I, you know, I've got brothers and sisters with, with Toronto police who are completely frustrated that it's a catch and release system. As I commit a firearms offense at 10 o'clock on Friday night, uh, I may have an online bail hearing sometime over the course of the night and I'm released in the morning on conditions that I was probably breaching in the first place. So when I look at those types of things, I look at it and, and I just don't think that, that our current government is being, is being focused on, on a solid firearms platform. And in fact, we all know, this whole group here knows that they're not. They, they seem to be placating to, to urban voters who may not have the knowledge that the folks in, in this forum today have. Uh, but I do believe that people are, are catching on and, and are starting to see through it. And, and I'll tell you what, Emily, you know what, if, if I was in your riding, you'd get my vote. So, you know, that's, I will always be a staunch conservative. I have been since I was a kid. So, <laughs> And I'm sure there's some eye rolling and groaning going on out there. But awesome. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Any, anyone else? Was there anything else? Thanks a ton for uh, joining us today, Earl. Yeah, no problem, Dave. I'm really, uh, I was really glad that, uh, that you brought me in. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'm seeing a lot of names here, actually, that, that, uh, that I recognize. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to, to listen in. And Emily, thank you very much for the reach out. And I will definitely be... Uh, be adding you so fair enough and i am on linkedin as well at earl green awesome
But yeah, so we'll take a couple minute break here and then we got uh, Ridge Wales and uh, Daryl Wilson from Vortex Optics to talk to us about uh, a bit of rifle shooting and, uh, and some of uh, the fundamentals of that and optics. Excellent. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.